Hello, and welcome to the Pain Perspective Podcast. I am Nikki, one of your hosts, here with my husband, the one and only Dr. Ashu Goyle. And together we are here to share real and organic conversations from people who have experienced pain, whether it be emotional, physical, or mental, and how they overcame it and created a life they love. We will also be sharing conversations with experts in the field to give you the tools and resources you need to live the healthiest and happiest life possible. Our hope for you is that you hear stories that will change your life and give you hope for the future, that you will walk away feeling motivated and like you can take on the world. Now grab that pen and paper. It's time for the Pain Perspective Podcast. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of The Pain Perspective. I'm Dr. Ashu Goyle. I'm here with my beautiful wife, Nikki Goyle. Hello. And we have the pleasure of having one of my best friends, one of my mentors, and just all around brilliant pain physicians, Dr. George Chang Chen, who's uh, with us today. And we're going to be talking about regenerative medicine as he's one of the world's experts in this field. Yeah, we really wanted to take a time to, you know, George is from Newport Coast, correct? And so we wanted to, while he's in town, sit down with him and just pick his brain about everything related to regenerative medicine, because that is something that you specialize in. And we really talk a lot about it to patients and on our platform. So we want to like get a behind the scenes look at regenerative medicine and kind of educate anybody who's watching and tell them how it can change their life. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to see you. I love, I love you guys so much. And I show you, you're, you're, you're done for now. You and I, we met in Napa, um, gosh, maybe 2017. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 2017. <laughs> and we just hit it off and had such a fantastic time. It's, it's amazing to watch how the two of you have grown and this beautiful practice that you have here in Scottsdale. It's just amazing. It's beautifully done. Yeah. Looks like a high end department store. It's like walking <laughs> in Neiman Marcus or the Ritz Carlton had, had a baby had a baby. That's you know? all this one. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And you guys have done so well for yourself. I love what you're doing with your practice and the services that you offer for your patients. Just absolutely people love you guys. So I'm just so proud of you. Cool. Well, you've been such a big influence uh to me. I mean Going back to 2017, I met you at, uh, it was a Napa pain conference that Dr. Grigsby holds yeah. every year. And the whole pre-conference day was dedicated to regenerative medicine. Yeah. And you were the moderator. Yeah. And uh, not only, only were you compelling and such a great speaker, but you were absolutely hilarious. I was like, this guy, I got to meet this guy because I want to hang out with this guy. <laughs> Maybe I can become just a little bit smarter, a little bit funnier if I spend time with you. So um, that's where it all started for me. I mean, I was at a I was at a transition point in my life where I was trying to figure out where I wanted to go with my career, you know, because modern medicine was just kind of, I felt like we were stuck. Yeah. And with, especially in pain management, it was the same thing, you know, yeah. epidural injections and steroid injections and physical therapy and medication management. I was like, there's gotta be something more to this. And you opened that door for me. Well, you're kind and, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I think we're all students, you know, we're just trying to, trying to do better for our patients. And, you know, I think a lot of doctors out there, um, get, get, they get stuck in a track and they never, a lot of them stop growing. And I, and I think our patients recognize that because you have Mm -hmm. patients who go out there and they see doctors and they feel like they get the same response and they're rushed Mm -hmm. through. And it's that like sort of cookie cutter medicine. People are put into boxes. And if, if your patient doesn't fit in a box today, if you're around, you're around and you're trying to squeeze you in a square peg or a a round thing into, into a square hole, you know, and I, I, patients get frustrated with that because they feel like they're trying, you know, they get and they can feel it. Mm-hmm. And I think there's definitely frustration with that. And I think um, because we're rushed in some ways of medicine, because modern medicine is run by corporate healthcare, this forces, you know, that we have pressures to push patients through faster. Mm-hmm. And so we feel that pressure and that reflects on the way we treat our patients. Absolutely. I think um, trying to move away from that and give people personalized care, the kind of care that they're really looking for, the kind of care that they deserve. Right. And I, I love the way you do that too, because you, you really, t- I've seen you in your practice and you guys take time, really get to know your patients, understand where they're coming from, understanding the things that make them unique, the little things that sound a little quirky that don't fit into those boxes, right? The little rough edges that everybody has yeah. that makes them unique, but that could make the difference, right? Just like I was speaking with your, um, 
It's a powerful story, you know, uh, your, your nurse, Laura. Yesterday. Yeah, she's extraordinary. And she yeah. was saying how she went and saw three rheumatologists, right? Experts, and I won't name the hospitals, but she said she had been to all the major, major hospitals, some of the big hospitals in the, in the area. And they, they wrote her off, right? They ran the, the usual test that we run, or people, the, the tests that are covered by insurance, right? right? And she did ask them, hey, how about genetic testing? How about these other things? And I said, look, you know, we can't order that. It's not, it's not on the menu for you. It's not covered by insurance. And they actually prescribed her antidepressants. Now, how many of our patients do you see that? Exactly. You don't fit into that hole. So here's some Balta. Here's here's it. Here's this antidepressant. Try, try this one. Take yeah. this one and go on about your way. Yeah, it's yeah. in your head. And you're it's, like, yeah. it's not. You know, mm-hmm. I don't need I don't need Percocet and Oxys. I don't yeah. want that. I want to find a solution to my problem. Right. Exactly. Such a powerful story that she said yesterday. She said she went and got genetic testing, and went back and they found that she had a, a hereditary disease. Right. And she was care for it, and it was enough. Yeah. And t- tell us what you did for her, because she, just so you know, and so th- let me finish the part. So she said she's been started on colchicine. Yeah. And for the people that don't know, there are medicines out there. Colchicine isn't so bad, but there are other medicines related to the type of disease she has. There's an inflammatory disease. She's talking about all of her hands are aching. She's a nurse, right? Busy, busy nurse. Her hands, all her joints are hurting throughout her body. And she said, if it wasn't that, the next thing they were going to do was either like methotrexate, mm-hmm. which, is a, which is a cancer drug, right? Chemotherapy mm-hmm. stuff. Or a biologic, which is a, which will actually suppress your immune system. So it sets you up for infection and illness and things like that. And then what'd you do for her? So she came to me, she crossed paths with me. Um, she, I call her my angel. She's extraordinary. She's a truly a blessing. Um, she's one of the most compassionate people I've ever met and also one of the smartest, but she came to me. She's like, Hey, I like the way you practice. I like the way you think. I see you interact with patients regularly. She's like, what if uh what if i came to see you what would you have to offer me so um and she was symptomatic at that point. oh she was very yeah, symptomatic yeah. i mean she was having rough nights rough days Where in all, yeah all yeah. day she would be just thriving with pain so there's an old medication called naltrexone right so this has been around since the 50s for those of you who don't know this medication it's the medication that's used to treat opioid addiction heroin addiction alcoholism it's also known as antabuse um people use this medication they can uh implant pellets um for patients who are alcoholics and then uh, if they drink alcohol they get violently ill because it blocks the receptors right so ideally it breaks the cycle of addiction um well in the late 70s early 80s there were some brilliant physicians dr bahari is one of the most recognized ones who started microdosing naltrexone. So we call that low dose naltrexone. Fast forward 40 years later, we found that it can have a profound anti-inflammatory effect in the body with very minimal side effects. Um, So we tried that and it's a medication that it's very subtle. You may not even know you're taking it. And uh, within a few months, it really changed her life. I mean, profoundly. She, the inflammation had gone down. She was sleeping better. She was having fewer flare-ups. I mean, I think she went maybe nine months without a flare-up, whereas before she was having them regularly. Um, so in addition to that, we've been doing IV uh, infusion therapy as well. So uh, one of the things we like to use uh, for inflammation is glutathione which is a, your, it's an antioxidant, it's produced in your liver. Um, but if you supplement with it, it can have more of a, of a profound anti-inflammatory effect throughout the system. And she's been responding very well to that. And so she's been doing that weekly. She does it weekly. It yeah. seems like her symptoms have been pretty much at bay. I mean, exactly. I haven't heard her talk about yeah. a flare up in a while. Right, right. No, I, yeah. So, I mean, these are some things that we have to do. Like you said, personalized medicine, thinking outside the box, right? Um, cause the inside the box wasn't working for her and the other options that were inside the box were potentially very harmful. Absolutely. Right. It's all risk versus benefits. So I know I've got several patients who have to take methotrexate and it's risk versus benefit for them. It gives them the quality of life they need. Right. But, uh, for someone who's not interested in that, you want to, you want a provider who can think outside the box and offer you some different alternatives that may be safer, that may actually be more effective. Yeah. So... Now, George, give us a little bit about your history. How did you get into regenerative medicine? So um, how did I get into regenerative medicine? When I, I actually had an interest in this. I injured myself when I was like really young, when I was 17 years old, I injured myself. And at that time when I was younger, I was really interested in in sports medicine and health and things like that. 
but uh, mostly because I thought I was going to be like the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was going to be the next Ashu Goyle, you know, and I love, yeah. So I injured myself doing that. And um, I was looking for options because I was so young, you know, the idea of having surgery for, for the, from the issues that I had didn't really appeal to me. And at that time I had spoken to people who had had surgery for, for what I had herniated, large herniated disc in my lumbar spine. And nobody I'd ever met who had had back surgery. And you can attest to this. It's almost universal. Even if they feel okay for a little bit of time, nobody um, is pain-free forever. Right. And people look at me, including doctors, and they'd say, you're, you're just too young. But, you know, these are the few options that we have for you. And how old were you at this point? Oh, I was 17. Okay. I, was, I hadn't even graduated high school yet. Okay. Um, so fast forward to that, it actually put me on track to become a doctor. And it made me more interested in this. And I was very, obviously, at that time from early age, I was very interested in musculoskeletal health, but then I became very interested in pain management. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had, had, had epidurals and things like that. And then when I was just doing my own research, I started looking into what, what else is out there. I did some basic science research at the time in stem cells and neuroscience. And I, at the time I thought I was gonna look at how to help people recover from like stroke and brain injury. And that's sort of where that went. I had worked in a lab where we actually dealt with stem cells and we were working on the brain and try to get people how to recover from neurological function. So that's where that kind of started. Now, then you're getting to med school eventually, and then all that stuff, all the other interests get go by the wayside because you're just focused on, um, you're just focused on what you're doing with at that moment. When I finally finished, though, I still I became a physiatrist. I did sports medicine, musculoskeletal medicine, did fellowship at the Steam Cleveland Clinic, same place that Shu Goyle and all of our good friends did uh, cl- uh, training app. How many years apart were you guys? Well, I finished the, my fellowship in 2007. And I, although he looks younger than me, my good brother <laughs> here, I finished my fellowship in 2015. Okay. Yeah. So I had a few years off yeah. in between okay. because I, I had to have back surgery eventually and things like that. Um, but, you know, the things that we do in pain medicine, they do help people. And when you're in, when you're in that kind of pain, you will take almost anything to mm-hmm. make it away. And I understand that. And I understand that from a patient's perspective. As well as from 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 the physician's perspective, I think though that we can oftentimes get disillusioned because as a patient, you're always asking the doctor, "What do you have? What what else do you have? Can you give me more?" And there's this sort of this fallacy in thinking because that you know, for instance, you think, and doctors fall prey to this as well. So, for instance, we'll do an epidural. Standard dosing for an epidural might be 20 milligrams of tramsinol, something like that, mm-hmm. common steroid that we use. So the, the thought process is, well, maybe 40 is better. Maybe 50 is better. Maybe 100 is better. And they've shown that that's not true. And the more you get, actually, the more side effects you have. Mm-hmm. And the same fallacy also falls into medications that we take. There's opioids and things like that. And this is where a lot of these problems um, manifest because patients are asking for more. We want to help them, but are we feeding into things that are actually not good for them? You know, people don't know this, but when you get opioid medications, they, they affect your bone health, mm-hmm. they affect your mood, your libido, your sleep, all your hormones, all of your hormones. Mm-hmm. And so chronic use of it actually resets your entire brain and it never addresses the underlying problem. So I know this is a long winded answer <clears throat> to great. what you asked me, yeah. but here's the point. If you come to me and you say, my shoulder hurts. There are things that I can do. I can try to directly address what's in your shoulder, what's in your knee with some type of intervention, an injection with a pinpoint needle, right? Or if we give you other things like medications, they don't actually address that problem. If we give you opioids, that's just a distraction in your brain. It's just a distraction. And so it never addresses the underlying problem. And that's why you you fall into this vicious cycle where you say, my shoulder hurts. I have this pill in a bottle and I'm going to take that. And all it does is block here. So, you know, I could set your shoulder on fire with with a, a with matches and a lighter and gasoline. And if I gave you enough opioids, you'd just be like, oh yeah, it's still on fire, but your your brain is masked. The beauty of regenerative medicine is that we're we're not only trying to address the underlying problem, mm-hmm. we're actually trying to improve it. So people don't recognize this. All the patients out there who have gotten corporate steroid injections, steroid injections, you always hear cortisone. Oh, I got some cortisone. The two medicines that doctors inject and that's not just doctors but anybody who does these procedures injects they inject local anesthetics numbing medicine and steroids what do these two do okay local anesthetics 
and steroids. It's very important people understand this. Mm -hmm. They have been shown to be directly toxic to your soft tissues. What does that mean? That means if we inject enough steroids into your knees, all of your cartilage, all of the cells in your cartilage will die. It's powerful because people mm -hmm. don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is people will get the first injection and say, oh, my God, that oh. injection lasted six months, 12 months. Or two years. Three or years. two years yeah, or three exactly. years. Mm -hmm. But the next one, what happens to the next one, Ash? Yeah, less effective. Less and effective. that's because the disease most likely has progressed. Yes. And the steroids are usually implicated in that. I mean, we're learning that now. Exactly. Sure. It's, it's, yeah, a lot of data is coming out on this. So... You know, we try to avoid this and you're trying and the, the reality is that I did that to my own mother. That's actually what really happened. She developed arthritis in her knee and I started injecting her steroids. And it wasn't until, you know, it got to a point where she said, Hey son, the last one only lasted like three weeks, four weeks. And I was like, man, what am I going to do now? You know? So then I really went and I investigated. That's how I figured that stuff out. And then I had to find other options for her. So I've been treating her with PRP and changing that though and so also she doesn't get any of those side effects those systemic widespread full body side effects from the steroids as well and so mm -hmm. prp is a form mm -hmm. of regenerative medicine so anybody who is listening or watching they're not familiar with prp can you explain that a little bit so prp stands for platelet rich plasma mm -hmm. so when we pull up your blood it looks red and it's because over 50 60 percent of it is red blood cells what else is in there is there just, there's the plasma, which is a little bit of a yellow color to it. And it's got a lot of small proteins in it that you can't see. It also has white blood cells, which help fight off infection and are important in not only that, but modulating the healing response. And also has platelets. Now platelets people think of are what help you stop bleeding. The platelets themselves are packed with what are called dense granules. And these dense granules having them over 30, 40 identified growth factors and cytokines. But these growth factors have a million names, um, or excuse me, each one, there's, 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 there's tons of them. There's 30, 40 of them plus that have been identified. And they are important because when your body identifies an injury, these platelets will go to that place and they'll degranulate, meaning they'll release their growth factors and they'll coordinate this entire healing response based off of that. Wow. And it's important to understand that because what happens is that you, what we're taking is that we're, we're collecting the blood. Well, let's say we collect, you know, Ash and I use a system made by a company called Apex Biologics and we'll collect 50, 55 milliliters of blood. At least. At least. Maybe 100. Or 100, yeah. 120, right? Yeah. And that's better why? Well, it's important because the platelets make up about 1% of the blood volume. So I like to use the analogy. It's like going to the ocean and trying to uh, say, well, there's fish in the ocean. And we go out there with like a little bucket and we're like, scoop up some water. And we're like, there's no fish in here. And the reason why that's important, you need a big net to catch some fish, right? And because if the platelets only make up 1% of the blood volume and you go to a place where they collect a 5cc tube of blood, the amount of platelets that they're going to get out of that is so minuscule that it's not really going to be meaningful. You need to collect enough blood and you need to use a good system that can separate these different properties. Mm -hmm. And that's why we invest in really the best equipment, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Because when people mm -hmm. are spending that kind of money and when they want to get better, you want to ensure that the treatment is as effective as possible. Exactly. We want to optimize outcomes, yeah. right? And one way we do that is by having good equipment and good products. Yeah. So top of the line backed by science, tons of clinical research and data to support the numbers that they promote. So the numbers meaning platelet counts, right? Absolutely. Because um, we want a high number of platelets. We're learning now through regenerative medicine with more research that's being done that cell count matters, right? And so we're learning that you have to, in some cases, we can actually dose the platelets and the dose matters. So as this unfolds, we'll have numbers and say, okay, well, we want this many millions of platelets for this condition. And this is where we'll put it. So completely yeah. agree with you. Completely agree with you. So, you know, it's good that you guys have invested, you know, in the best equipment. You know, I've seen your office, everything from top to bottom, front to back. You guys invested in, in what's research based, evidence based medicine, and you've trained your staff to be fantastic as well. But I mean, you guys have just hit all the boxes, you know, excellent. But that's, that's part of it though, you know, and, and people always wonder. So we get patients, you've seen this, patients will come and say, Oh, you know, that PRP stuff doesn't work. 
right? And you tell me, Ash, what do people say? They'll say, oh, I went down the street. Exactly. What did they get down the street? So, Ash? I mean, it's, it's really unfortunate because I'll hear a lot of patients say, oh, I had PRP in my back. It didn't really work. I'm like, well, tell me how it was done. Well, I kind of pointed back here and they put the needle there and did some shots back there. I did that, you know, weekly for three or four weeks and didn't get any benefit out of it. And then I have to explain to them that what they did is paid for expensive trigger point injections. Yeah. There was no image guidance whatsoever. Yeah. There's no precision. It's find a tender spot, inject whatever yeah. plasma they're injecting, and who knows if it's high quality or not. Um, but they're considering that PRP yeah. treatment. Yeah. So or and 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 then you ask them how did they get your blood, right? And they said, Oh, they just pulled it up and put it in a little test tube. Ten yeah, yeah. ten cent test tube. For everybody out there who's getting this done. They have to understand these little test tubes. There, there's different companies that make them, but one of the biggest companies is they're called BD vacutainers, and these are not FDA approved to be opened up and reintroduced into the human body. Mm -hmm. So the person who's out there using these, I'm telling you right now, the person, the people, the multiple, the multitudes of people who are out there using this, actually, I, I'm almost 100% sure it's complete. It's against the FDA. So it's not even legal for them to do this. And so they're doing this. I think it's probably, um, it's definitely suboptimal care. And maybe pushing ethics is a little bit of, you know, I don't know exactly how you want to define that, but I, I can tell you that it's not defined. Um, the reason why the products we use not only are evidence based, but the reason why they're, they're expensive, right? We invest in high quality equipment is because they've gone through that entire process. They've been vetted by that Food and Drug Administration mm -hmm. so that they can have these designations. This is what it's for. It comes sterilized. We know exactly what we're getting. It's not just some tube that I pull out of my, out of my, you know, the back of my car, right? Yeah. You know, I, I think you guys have done a great job doing that. Um, and you're, you're offering, you know, stem cell therapies, bone marrow aspiration in your practice. Yep, absolutely. So and explain what the bone marrow aspiration is. So and stem cell. Yeah, sure. So everyone stem cells is a bug, buzzword right. in the medical yeah. community, right? Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, I want stem cells. I want stem cells. Well, stem cells aren't commercially available in the U.S. And um, the only place you can truly get them uh, that's FDA approved, if you will. I mean, it's not really approved, but it's FDA allowed would be from the bone marrow. That's where your stem cells are. You can also get it from fat tissue as well. We call that adipose. But there's some question as to whether or not the FDA accepts that as a viable, as a legal source for stem cells. So bone marrow is probably the safest way we can get stem cells. And that's coming from your own body. It is. Versus yeah. a, mm -hmm. a donor. Right. And stem cells is more of a generic term. Um, okay. You know, we actually call these medicinal signaling cells now, MSCs. Okay. So, or yeah, they used to be called mesenchymal stem cells, but now they're medicinal signaling cells because what they do is we extract them from the bone marrow, we filter them out, process them like we would do very similar to PRP, and then we can re-inject re those into different areas. And what they do is they basically stimulate the cells in the area to divide and multiply and ideally heal tissue. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, th I think wow. it's important because a lot of people are out there and sort of this goes back to what you were saying. Not only are they getting blind trigger point injections, mm -hmm. but they're getting marketed things that are called stem cells, sure. right? Exactly. Yo, I, yeah, I have patients who see me pretty much weekly. One person I saw earlier this week, he's like, oh, I had a stem cell injection in my knee. I'm like, tell me about that. I'm like, well, they took the fluid, injected it. I'm like, they get it from your bone marrow? No. They get it from your fat? No. I'm like, it's not stem cells. <laughs> yeah. I was like, most likely it's acellular amniotic fluid allograft, mm -hmm. which is basically... Um, the fluid that's in the uh, placenta, you can oh. extract that. The FDA requires that all the cells be taken out. You can have no cells in this. If you do, that's an FDA violation. What's left are millions and hundreds of millions of growth factors, similar to what's in our plasma that we're trying to concentrate with PRP. But this is coming fresh from a, um, a placenta. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So most likely that's what they had done. Yeah. So when patients are saying they're having stem cell injections or stem cells yeah. IV, it's not stem cells. It's and the semiotic fluid. What are the product. benefits of doing stem cells versus PRP, which is coming from your own body? You know, um, I like to tell people that the stem cell sort of has a brain, and, and it doesn't necessarily have a brain. What it really has, it has, it has a nucleus, and the nucleus is you can think of it as a brain for the cell, or you can think of it as a manufacturing plant. 
So this is what happens. You have the platelets. The platelets don't have nuclei. They, they're, they're, um, they'll, they'll recognize an injured place. They'll migrate there and then they, they spit up everything. And that everything is including, um, things that will recruit stem cells to the area. If we take your bone marrow and we aspirate, we concentrate it and we get BMAC, bone marrow aspiration concentration. And we get off that buffy coat and we inject that into that area. What happens is that those stem cells, those stem cells have receptors on them. And what happens is that it's sort of like if you come to a place and someone's shouting for help. Like I come over, I drive up to your house and I say, hey, Ash has said, George, George, help me. But that cell internalizes that signal and it can respond to it. So those signals will go to the nucleus and the nucleus can create new proteins. Now manufacture what that tissue is going to need. So it can create downstream effects that amplify not only the healing response and it recruits more cells, but that's what you need to, to actually heal. You need to create new collagen. You, knew, you, you can create new proteins that are going to help re, restructure that tissue. And so that's the difference. The, so the pure, so what actually is probably beneficial is actually to have both of those there. We're putting the PRP there. And for a lot of people, especially if they're younger and healthier, they're going to have a good response. If that's not quite enough, or if you're a little bit past mild and moderate disease, and maybe you need something more robust, we might obtain that bone marrow and put it right there and try to like really get like, you know, bring in the generals, you know what I mean? Have them figure out what's going on, clean the stuff up. The other thing that's in there is also there's white blood cells, which correlate the healing response. And also there's macrophages there that help take away like dead necrotic tissue or tissue that's injured and try to clean that up so that you have a clean slate to wow. work on. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating. So you have mm -hmm. like, and correct me if I'm saying this wrong. So you have conventional medicine, which is basically like sticking on, sticking a bandaid on the issue. Mm -hmm. And then you have regenerative medicine, which I know we're not supposed to use this, but technically it's basically healing the injured tissue. That is absolutely right. Okay. And I know, I'll tell you this interesting thing. I, I think I try to consider myself purist. Mm -hmm. And what I say that is that because I'll, I'll see people who do what I do and what do we do? And they'll say, I cure pain. And to be honest with you, having done enough epidurals and knee injections with steroids and things like that, I don't believe that at all. Right. Cause yeah, I've, I agree. it doesn't matter how much time we buy you mm -hmm. um, to say we're curing it is kind of a stretch. Mm -hmm. And I, but I can tell you that since I've transitioned my practice to, um, you know, we call it general medicine, we call it orthobiologics. I've had enough patients who have come back. I've had enough patients who have told me I was already scheduled for surgery and we tried mm -hmm. this. And then I went back and I got an MRI later or I saw my, or my surgeon and I felt good enough. I completely postponed surgery to the point where and now I didn't even have surgery. Mm -hmm. I actually feel confident enough. I don't tell people that I don't, I don't, I never oversell, mm -hmm. never oversell. But I feel confident enough that I feel like we're, we're, we're changing the course of their disease. We're completely altering that person's life. You imagine you're born and you get to a certain age. And as you slowly age, things start falling apart. Your knee starts to ache, your neck, your back, right? Things like that. Your skin starts to sag. You get wrinkles, all these things. And with these interventions, we can change the trajectory of your course. Now, we're all going to die one day. We're not, you know, nobody's telling we're going we're gonna to make it live forever. But can we make you feel better, healthier, younger as you age into your 50s and 60s so that you don't feel that? You don't feel like you're 80 at 80. Maybe you'll feel 80 at 90, right? And do that without destroying tissue, <clears throat> which is the most of what conventional medicine allows us to do or forces us to do. Insurance companies don't cover the regenerative medicine exactly. treatments, so these are all cash pay treatments, but they kind of force us into, or at least for most patients, steroid injections, which do have consequences. I mean, acutely, they can provide profound relief, sometimes a few months, sometimes even longer, yeah. but the long-term consequences are irreversible. You know, I'll be honest with you, this is a little controversial, but I actually, I'll tell you why I don't like insurance. I don't want insurance to cover this. Mm -hmm. Biggest reason why I've seen in medicine is that something new and shiny comes along. You get a new toy and there are people who are not invested in trying to learn mm -hmm. how to do it well, right. how to practice right. it at the highest level. They don't invest in the highest, the, the best equipment. They don't invest the time to learn how to do these procedures mm -hmm. at the highest level. 
like the commitment you, you, you've had in the last eight years, you've mm-hmm. like thrown yourself whole body, mind, body, soul yeah. into this to yeah. really try to push yourself Absolutely. to learn this at the highest level. And there's going to be people, let's say tomorrow, Medicare started approving and paying for this. I guarantee you, this is what happens. They, they pay a decent amount. People go, oh my God, this is paid for now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to do it as cheaply as I can. Make as much money as I as can. As much money as I yeah. can make. And they will not try to learn to do it well. Right. And the outcomes will suck. Mm-hmm. And they'll abuse the code. And when they abuse the code and the outcomes suck, Medicare starts looking at it. They say, you know what? This doesn't work. We're going to pay you less. Mm-hmm. Or we're not going to even cover it anyways. Right. Then enough people are out there and they say, you know what? It sucked and it didn't work. And then it's the same problem. They right. said, hey, well, how did they do it? They said, oh, they just... A little test tube, BD test tube, 10 cc. Exactly. <clears throat> 5 yeah. cc, 6 yeah, cc. Exactly. And they do it poorly and they don't yeah. try to do it at the level that can actually help people. Mm-hmm. And it ruins it for everyone. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually okay with that. And because I think it allows us to to continue to practice it and, and do it at a, at a way that can really help exactly. people. Yeah, because this is a... No- a lot of what we do in medicine <clears throat> that's insurance based is based on volume. Mm-hmm. We need to see a lot of patients because reimbursement has dropped. Overhead keeps on going up. Reimbursement drops. So you have to see more and more people yeah. with this regenerative medicine. Like I'm fortunate that when I do have someone who's willing to invest in themselves and pay me for what I, what I think I'm worth and I feel I'm worth, I can spend an hour to two hours doing the procedure with them, yeah. you yeah. know? And that's what it is. It's not a conveyor belt of people coming through. Yeah. Like if you're getting regenerative medicine with me and I know with you, I learned from you. So I know your approach is to really individualize and personalize the treatment, yeah. see what the person needs, you know, do a great physical exam, get an MRI study. So you have a detailed imaging of the anatomy and you can yeah. see what the problem may or may not be and the correlate that with the physical exam. And also what they tell you their issue is, I mean, patients tell us if we listen, we, we have all the answers we need from what they tell us. And, you know, in a cash paid situation, you have time to do that. Yeah. It's really unfortunate that insurances keep on squeezing and uh, don't give us the time to really connect with people. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to change that in my practice because I accept all insurances too, yeah. you know, um, and I'm trying to spend more time with people just so we can have that authentic connection that I can really listen to people and find out what they need. But that being said, with regenerative medicine, like it just takes longer time and it should. Absolutely. I mean, that's the way to do this. This isn't, you know, squirt it in there, see you later, you know, yeah. come back in two weeks and, and do it again. That's yeah. what I've seen mm-hmm. with you is, yeah, like you just said, it's not so simple as let me hear, let me just give you an injection because just from the conversations that we've had, it seems like every patient is different based on their injury. And so there's a whole method that you have to formulate. And some people might be more involved and some people may not be as involved, Mm -hmm. but with the regenerative medicine, it allows you to treat them individually and not a one size fits all for each patient. So true. And one thing, George, from your very first lecture in 2017, you said, this stuff is not pixie dust. You're not just going to sprinkle it on the area and you're going to magically be healed. I have a lot of patients who come to me for regenerative medicine and I tell them they're not good candidates at all. Like you need a knee replacement. That's just what you do. It's too late. Your hips bone on bone. Like it's not going to be worth your investment. You'll be very disappointed. So let's get into that. So tell us who's a candidate and who is not. You know, that's a really, really good question. That's, that's really nuanced, but I want to point out one thing though. Ash, I think, I think that the biggest thing in your practice is that, you know, your patients love you. They love you because no matter what their payer is, I do see you give them time. You develop the relationship. You really dig down. And the issue that I see for you is that then you, when they say, doc, I trust you, you tell me, what do you think is best? Yeah. And that's the problem because I know what I think is best. I know I, you know, there's people out there that say, I treat my patients like I treat, like I would treat my family mm-hmm. and they don't mean it. Yeah. And then there's people like you who, who say, I wouldn't offer you anything that I wouldn't offer my wife, exactly. right? Yeah. My mother, my sister. Mm-hmm. And the problem is that we want to offer them things that are outside the box. Exactly. Outside, because we, we've we learned that the traditional medical model fails so many people and it's yeah. it's detrimental to people's health, right? So, so I know you're giving that people, it's just difficult because now you're like, your hands are tied. Yeah. It's like, it's like I have this mat, this not magical, this perfect, wonderful yeah, thing right. for you right here, mm-hmm. but my hands are tied, right? Yeah. Um, so your question was, you know, what makes a good candidate, right? You know, it's interesting. Um, and this is, 
there's some science to that. And there's also philosophy. Um, I, I think I used to, I used to be the same way. I would say, you know what, this is bone on bone, this and that. Like, I don't think you're, you're a good candidate. The thing is that I, I've come to a realization in my life that I think, honestly, I think everybody's, everybody can try it. And everything we do in medicine, you have to look at the risks versus benefits. So I have, I had a, I have patients who will come to me for treatment. And they say, listen, I just, I love to ski the rest of the year. You know, I may, may or may not suffer, but can you help me get through this next ski season? Let me see if I can get one more ski season. Yeah. I've got six trips lined up. I'm going to Vail. I'm going to here. I'm going to here. I'm going to Aspen, all these places. Right. And so, and I'll look at their MRI and I'll see, oh my God, you know, this is pretty bad. Um, but we'll examine them, try to figure out exactly where their pain is coming from. We we'll try to treat that. And I've had a lot of people surprise me. Because if we look at the risk versus benefits, right? People don't know this. The percentage of people who have total knee replacement that continue to have pain afterwards mm -hmm. is over 40%. Mm -hmm. That's mind blowing. Think about mm -hmm. that. Your knee hurts now. Mm -hmm. We're going to take you for this big surgery. Anybody who's out there thinking about a knee replacement, YouTube knee replacement surgery, you see exactly what they do because it's pretty brutal. They have to shave it all off, cut it mm -hmm. off. And then they're hammering this thing down. Oh, boom. <laughs> boom. Boom. I feel boom. like I'm... <laughs> it's traumatic. Yeah. It's traumatic on the body. And you have this big incision. And then they tell you, well, it, it, there's 12 months of rehab. Mm -hmm. 12 it's months of rehab, but there's 12, 12 yeah. months until the dust settles. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take months and months for you to even regain your range of motion. Mm -hmm. Just even bend your knee. And then for me to say, by the way, nobody told you this, but in the fine print or what somebody could have told you, is that it's almost a coin flip, right? Literally pull out a coin and it's like, let's flip it, Ash. After all that, are you gonna have the same knee pain, worse knee pain, or no knee pain? You're like, it's just a coin flip. You think about that. So I've started to think, listen, if you think you're that this is what you need, especially if you're too young for a knee replacement, a knee replacement has, has a lifespan. How long is it gonna last us? Somewhere between 12 to 20 years. They'll say 15 on average. So if you're 40, 45 years old and you need, you have bad knee pain and you need a knee replacement and you get it done today, it's a real, really bad candidate because by the time you're 60, you might need another one. And for them to pull that thing out, wow. have that bone completely <laughs> macerated and then have to put in a new one, that's a bad, bad outcome. So that's why they'll push it on. They say, oh, wait till you're in the year 50s, wait till you're 55. Oh. Maybe it'll, it'll last the rest of your life, right? So I actually think the risk benefit, even though it's cash and all that stuff, yeah. the risk benefit for people is actually really low because it's Absolutely. super safe. <clears throat> yeah. It's not going to hurt your joints. Right. It's non-surgical, which non -surgical. is nice. Yeah. yeah. And I do and have patients. Non, oh. You don't, you know, yeah. there's no opioids involved. So exactly. it's all natural. Yeah. You're, you're using your own body, yeah. which is really nice. Yeah. You know, and I'll, I do have patients who are grade four, bone on bone, osteoarthritis, knees, hips, shoulders, and some have done really well. Yeah. Like I'm able to maintain them because for them, surgery is not an option. Exactly. It's do whatever you can. I can't do surgery for one reason or another, whether it's a cardiac issue or, you know, some kind of health concern, or they just don't want to do it. They're maybe, maybe exactly. advanced age. I've been able to maintain several people, several, a lot of patients with just doing PRP. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Yeah. It'll surprise you. I used to look at people and, you know, like I said, I, I don't, I don't, taking, uh, accepting someone's money is not going to, for that procedure, it's not going to change my life. You know, more important to me is really trying to do the right thing for them, right? And I know you practice the exact same way. And so, but I have found that, oh my gosh, well, you said, doc, let's try it anyways, because what are my options? The steroid injections don't work anymore. And I had a thousand of those before I met you until you told me they're bad for me, right? I don't want surgery or I, or I, issues that I can't have surgery, what are my options? Dealing with it, because we're all going to die at some point, right? Dealing with it, telling someone to suffer for the rest of their life really isn't great. Mm -hmm. I don't want opioids. I don't want this and that. Or I still want to stay active, right? Mm -hmm. What are your options? You say, well, let me try this. And really, when you start thinking like that, you say, listen, you know, the, the, the little bit of money that this is involved in that is really not outside the realm of, okay, what are my other options? Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. The, the, think of the hours you save mm -hmm. from getting even physical therapy mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have physical therapy, but the, the painful type of physical yeah. therapy you have after like a shoulder replacement. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. It's a very intensive 
um, post, you know, rehab protocol, you know, uh, knee, knee replacement, all of that. I mean, my mom had to do that and her other knee hurts her. And she's like, I would never do that again because mm -hmm. it's so traumatic. And at, now at her age and in her seventies, we would never let her do it anyway. Mm -hmm. But luckily she has a son who's a world expert in regenerative medicine, exactly. you know, speaks all over the world, teaches all over the world who can put some PRP into her knee and keep her going. Well, yeah. thank you. I appreciate that. I'll tell you something. I wish I had started practicing this before she got, and, you know, she got her knee replacement when I was, I was like still in residency or not even residency. I was still in uh, med school, but I wish I had known, her, like I had been practicing this, you know, back then, you know. I'm loving this conversation. I mean, both of you are so articulate when you're explaining regenerative medicine. And for me, who's not in the medical field, you've really made it easy to understand and weigh out the benefits from, you know, the, the cons and the, the benefits. So I'm thinking we have this meal here. Should we go and enjoy it? Talk it a little bit amazing. more. Thank yes. you. I'm so excited. I always love coming here. You guys make the best food. She I'll, makes the best she, food. She, yeah, that's true. That's true. Ash eats I, the best I, I, food. Yeah, though. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. She eats the best food every day. I'm so jealous. I'm just waiting for you guys to adopt me. You're adopted already. All right. Uh, All right let's go. Awesome. George, this has been a fascinating conversation. Love having you here. Thank you so much for spending the weekend with us and for also for treating my knee. Nikki, what have you created here? So I'm pouring us a little bit of sake. This is a local sake that is made by a gentleman here actually in Arizona, and it's fantastic. And it's going to be paired with a halibut that has been simmered in, um, I basically did like a green goddess dressing and I simmered it with a little bit of garlic, some fennel, and then I served it with a white rice that's been infused with lemongrass from our garden. Mm -hmm. And then on top is a red chili and cilantro kind of slaw, almost or oil. I don't I don't know what you want to call it, but it's a garnish on top and it's got garlic, more garlic and yeah. So I got a question for vi yes. for viewers who don't know what it is and maybe a host who doesn't know what it is. Yes. What, what is green goddess dressing? So that's a great mm -hmm. question. And I'm glad you asked me. So green goddess dressing. I if you follow me on Instagram, I just posted the recipe not too long ago, but it is basically olive oil. There's avocado. I did a mixture of fresh herbs in there. Uh, there is a little bit of lemon juice and I do a little bit of liquid aminos because it adds a natural kind of salt to the mm -hmm. dressing and gives it a little extra flavor and just some seasonings. And then I blend it all together and you can use it. I use it on fish. You can use it on salads. And Sounds amazing. I just keep it in our yeah. fridge. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. And I've, it's healthy yeah. too, because it has all the mm -hmm. fresh herbs and the, if you, and the avocado. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's a good way to kind of get some greens. Like if you're trying, if you have any picky eaters or people who don't want to eat avocado or eat their vegetables, you can kind of get away with doing that. Sneaking and, it in there. And <clears throat> saying it's a sauce. Yeah. yeah. I love eating here because you guys make the best food. And <laughs> it's always you. so healthy. I think the recipes you post are like, they're, they're some of the best out there. And the Thank food you. you make, every time I eat here, I just feel like I'm eating at like, I don't want to even name them, but like nicer than the French laundry. Oh, you know, gosh, no. Oh, no, you're amazing. very sweet. Thank, thank you. And I this appreciate is, this that. This is great. I've never had this before, yeah. but... Cheers. Cheers. Salud. Sorry, Salud. I'm already drinking. This no, is amazing. Okay. Please enjoy. Salute to you guys. This this I've never heard of this, but this is really good. Yeah, it's an Arizona sake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My ginger. Interesting. This is fantastic though. I'm, oh, I'm gonna yeah, have to get some good. of that. I like yeah. that a lot. I personally mm -hmm. like like sake. I tend to we love we're both wine drinkers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we don't drink a lot. Uh we're we're not big alcohol drinkers. Mm -hmm. But on the weekend, we will enjoy a glass of wine. But I've been noticing with me and my body lately, wine has been affecting me a little bit. And I don't know if it's the sulfites or mm -hmm. what it is, but, it, you know, especially wine that's been produced here in the United States, mm -hmm. I tend to do a little bit better with more of like the French wines mm -hmm. because from what I understand, and I could be wrong, they tend to have cleaner practices when yes. it comes to growing their grapes. Yes. So I do a lot better and that's what I usually tend to go to. But I also do really, I do fine with sake. I don't mm. usually feel hungover. Um, and it, you know, it's very clean. It's easy on my system. 
sometimes with red wine, I'll find that I get a little bit of acid Mm -hmm. reflux, whereas I don't with this. So a hundred percent agree with you actually, because so I have the same problem. The the tannins probably put me to sleep. It's interesting because I'm a big whiskey drinker, Mm -hmm. um, low scotch bourbon, um, Japanese whiskey, but, uh, the red wines, especially, that there's something in there that makes me sleepy. I'm not drunk. Mm-hmm. It makes me sleepy, mm-hmm. but I definitely get that acid reflux. Yeah. But the biggest thing I think I'm fearful, and I completely agree with you, that's the fear is that uh, I have some concerns about the, um, the pesticides yeah. mm-hmm. that they have. Yeah. And so I've really kind of, you know, and you're right. I think mm-hmm. I think that's uh, probably wines made in the United States. And there mm-hmm. are organic wines, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. they're not traditionally the ones that people say are like, you know, people hold no the are yeah. exactly right. Mm-hmm. Well, and the Europeans just tend to, from what I have seen, they tend to have a stricter kind of guideline when they are producing items. So whether it be food, yes. you know, even all of my uh, flowers and things that I buy, I buy them from an importer who imports it from Europe. Mm-hmm. So I have a French flower. It's an organic whole wheat flower that I use. And a doctor has told me about it and introduced me to it and told me that it's supposed to have less gluten than Mm -hmm. what you can buy here in the United States. So whenever I'm cooking, I'm really mindful about ingredients and the health of our bodies. And that kind of goes into the regenerative medicine, what we've been talking about, because from my understanding as an outsider, and I want Mm -hmm. you guys to correct me and tell me your thoughts, but it seems like, you know, when it comes to regenerative medicine, in order to improve outcomes and create the best results, you know, there's kind of a process that goes into it, which would include, you know, diet and lifestyle at home. Tell Mm -hmm. me your thoughts about that. I mean, so what I tell patients when we're doing PRP or any kind of regenerative medicine where we use their autologous uh, plasma, which means it comes from them. Oh, okay. Got so it. yeah, if we're using your own body product uh, to treat you, I tell patients, you're the pharmaceutical company that's making the drug that I'm going to be injecting back <laughs> in your body. I love body. that so I, I say it all the time. That's so amazing. my Regen Med patients know this and I tell them, make it good because mm-hmm. it's the plasma is only going to be as good as you make it. So what do you do to make it well? Well, you avoid processed foods. You definitely cannot smoke cigarettes. I mean, I tell patients I want you cigarette free for at least two months, you know, just because uh, something basic about cigarettes, when you inhale the cigarettes, there's carbon monoxide in the smoke. It displaces the oxygen from hemoglobin. So basically you're starving your tissues of oxygen. When you're doing a regenerative medicine procedure, you want the best healing capability that your body can produce. Cigarettes interfere with that. Same thing with anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, ibuprofen, Aleve, I tell them at least two weeks before and as long as you can afterwards because we need that healthy inflammatory response as George was uh, describing earlier to open up those platelets so the growth factors can get released, released, those granules can get released. So diet's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. What they ingest, lifestyle, including not smoking, sleep is incredibly important. Um, exercise. Movement? Yeah, yeah, movement's yeah. really important. You know, Dr. Bert Mandelbaum is one of, you know, the leaders in orthobiologists as well. And uh, I had the privilege of sitting down with him at dinner uh, last month, thanks to George, um, me being his plus one at a, a faculty dinner. But I really got to connect with him. And, you know, one thing he's doing, I've been following his protocols for quite some time, too, ever since I learned about him, in addition to George's protocols, but um, he has his athletes. So he's a team doctor for the U.S. soccer team, took care of some notable athletes and presidents throughout his uh, his history, his career. But um, he has his patients do uh, 20 minutes of high intensity interval training, one minute on, one minute off, one minute on, one minute off. And he was explaining that it increases your hematopoietic stem cells, which are basically stem cells throughout the body. Okay. It also activates your sirtuin genes, which are genes in your body that are anti-aging, that make certain proteins that are beneficial for uh, healing. And he said he wants his patients to do that for at least seven days before, sometimes even the morning of the procedure. And how many, <clears throat> you said one minute on, one minute off. For, for 20 half, minutes, for 20, 20 to 30 minutes. minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, as tolerated, of course, if you're not athletic, and that's maybe not something you want to do. Reduce that time. Exactly. Yeah. Reduce that time or just, you know, instead of typically with high intensity interval training, you go 90% of your all out max and then you take it for the minute and then you take it back to maybe 20% 
or even less for the next minute than back to 90 percent if you're not in good physical shape or condition to do that maybe go 30 to 40 percent and back it off but still just some kind of exercise the week before um I've got some professional football players I take care of, ex-professional football players I take care of, and they'll uh, several of them will do two to three days of fasting before their blood draw. They'll just do a water only, which um, some people can handle, some people can't, but that has the same effect. Okay, it stimulates your stem cells genes mm-hmm. and it stimulates your sirtuin genes, which are anti-aging. So um, these are things you can do beforehand. What about stress? Stress, absolutely, because cortisol, right? Yeah. Cortisol increases inflammation. It reduces your body's ability to heal. So if you're in a stressful situation, when your blood's drawn, you're putting that back into a concentrated form in your body, right? So, yeah, meditation, sleep, all that's important beforehand. Anything else you would consider I before? I agree. Yeah. No. Um, <clears throat> along the lines of, of stress, I think getting uh, good hydration, getting good sleep, resting, reducing our stress levels up until we're going to do the blood draw. Um, so exercise has been known to reduce stress, right? Mm-hmm. Improves your mood, improves your sleep. So that's part of it. And it ties into that though. So, you know, if you are, um, if you're going to come in for this and you're saying, well, I also have this huge deadline at work. I have this, you know, multi-million dollar project that I'm working on. I'm super high stress. I'm sleeping three hours and it's, it's disturbed sleep. That might not be the time to do this, mm-hmm. you know, either settle your business and then, take a two week sabbatical from work or a one week sabbatical, whatever it might be, but take your stress level down, get, you know, get your good sleep, um, get your mood better, all those things, mm-hmm. mind, body, spirit, right? Yeah, Put it all together. Exactly. Um, and, and also, you know, the other thing that plays into that is actually um, antidepressants. Mm-hmm. So um, if it's possible for you to come off your antidepressants, I'm not saying that that's possible in all of our patients, but most of the serotonin, which is, in the human body, and most of the antidepressants that work out there called serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they're actually locked up in your platelets. Mm-hmm. And your platelets need that serotonin actually to have their normal function. And so I think all that plays into it itself, sure. right? And your mood itself, you know? So um, whatever we can do to, to optimize the outcomes so that you, you know, and, and I really think not only do they not always do the right thing for, our, for the people out there, but if you don't take into effect all of these things, you know, all we're trying to do is try to push the needle in the right direction. We're trying to push you, nudge you towards healing. Okay. And it's difficult, right? This is why if you smoke, you drink, you sleep two hours a night, you eat horribly, you eat processed food, fats, drinking coffee, like it, you know, was your lifeline, right? And then we're trying to push you. You start from a much lower place. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to get you to here. And if you don't help me by getting to here as a starting point, and you're starting off here, then me, whatever I can push you up, I can only get you so far, right? And you have to take that. The patient has to take the impetus to help themselves. But if we can help them and coach them with that mm-hmm. to get them to that point, then I think our results are much better. Yeah. I've had patients who are in their 70s and 80s who've come to me. And I, you know, I used to think, you know what? I don't know if this is really going to help you. And then I asked them, you know, tell me about your life. And give them that five minutes, 10 minutes. Tell me about your life. You know, what did you do in your 20s? Did you play sports growing up? We've had patients and one of the patients that you sent me early on, right? Mm-hmm. She is now in her late seventies mm-hmm. and she, she said, Oh, I, I used to be a semi pro t- tennis player. I golfed. I used to ride a hundred miles. So they're called century rides. She used to ride century rides mm-hmm. on a road bike. She's been doing that super active, super healthy her entire life. And she's responded remarkably to these therapies. Mm-hmm. And I really think it's because she has a really strong foundation, a strong base for that, right? Mm -hmm. So that she doesn't eat any of those things. She gets her sleep. She gets her fluids. She stays out of the sun. She puts on her sunscreen, like all the things that people talk about. She's a good patient Mm -hmm. and she doesn't do that for us. She does that for herself. Exactly. We have to encourage them because they might not know that, right? They don't, they might not remember that. It's just like the dentist. Nikki, have you been flossing, (laughs) right? Exactly. I just saw a dentist last week. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Have you been flossing? Like, no. But thank you for reminding. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we they need that. So we push them. Right. We push them. And then we give them, we have fertile ground. Yeah. We plant the seeds and we see how we can get to grow. Right. Exactly. Well, and the reason for all of that, I mean, even what we are doing at the practice, you're doing the regenerative medicine, but then we also have these other areas to support patients. Mm-hmm. So we have, you know, 
diet, we help them with diet, anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the IV wellness. We can help them with stress reduction techniques, all of these different things. But the reason why we almost kind of really focus on, you know, honing in on these different things is because as you age, it's just going to help you age gracefully and it's going to hopefully prevent disease and, you know, other things as you get older. So you can actually enjoy your life and you're not ridden with pain or have all these different, you know, ailments that are preventing you from living a nice, happy life. I think that's perfect. You know, aging gracefully is a great way of putting it because we have patients, you know, I've had patients come in and I say, you know, oh, is this your son? And they're like, no, that's my husband. And it's a very awkward moment. And I've learned not to do that. But early in my career, I'm, I'm so sorry. And it tells you something because it says, well, it's obviously some of that is genetic makeup. But also Absolutely. it's like, well, what do you do? What do they do? Yeah. Um, and I get it, birds of a feather flock together. Yeah. But it's also, well, I smoke and I and he doesn't. And I do this and he doesn't. So we're in two separate, you know, we, li- we, li- we live two separate lives, yeah. two those separate lifestyles in the same home, right? And so you see that, you you know, you think of a, I actually have a talk I just put together on this. You know, if you Google an internet search and you Google 50 year old man mm-hmm. and you'll get someone who looks like Ash, who looks like he's 40, mm-hmm. right? Or you'll get someone who looks like they're like your grandfather, right? And so it's those lifestyle mm-hmm. changes and those lifestyle decisions you make that um, really become apparent as you get older. Like teenagers don't recognize that, right? So you can smoke, mm-hmm. drink, party like you're in a rock star when you're in your 20s. But a lot of that starts to manifest as you grow older, right? Right. It does. And, you know, you realize that your body doesn't like it. It doesn't tolerate it. I mean, being, I'm in my now, what, mid to late, mid to late 30s. But you start to realize that your body doesn't like a lot of the stuff that you're doing in the 20s. You know, your body, and I learned this through my own health and wellness journey, that your body likes good food. It likes sleep. It likes when you're treating it right and you're practicing mindfulness and you're outside and Mm -hmm. you're in that gratitude state with your, you know, loved ones. So Mm -hmm. you learn that these are things that your body really, so if we can, if we can learn it at an earlier age and start implementing these practices, I mean, you can live a really happy and fulfilled life. But it's never too late to start. It's never too late to start. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, my grandmother is, and we've talked about her. She's a perfect example of it. Mm -hmm. She's was diagnosed with hepatitis at a, um, I would say at 50 years old, most people that would be detrimental to them. And she has taken care of her body in a way she doesn't really, I would say, I'm not even going to say she doesn't really, she does not drink alcohol at Mm -hmm. all. She eats well. She walks every day and that's it. I mean, that's really all it takes. And oh, she's, and she's in, in her, her 80s, 80s yeah. and I would say she's healthier than most That's of 40 us. 40-year-olds. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing that I think is fantastic that you guys do is that Ash has really taken the time to really study and learn what are the best optimal protocols for IV, IV hydration Absolutely. and IV supplementation. Yeah. And, you know, people don't recognize this, but a lot of the oral supplements we take, actually the bioavailability, mm-hmm. meaning how much of it is actually absorbed by the body versus just being passed through, mm-hmm. it's actually quite low. And especially if you take really low-end vitamins, mm-hmm. things that you get at the cheap, you know, if you buy your vitamin mm-hmm. and it comes in this big honking horse pill mm-hmm. that feels like a rock, and you think that you're going to take that with a glass of water and it's going to absorb in your body be easily digested and be easily yeah. digested and absorb in your body and, and have good nutrition uh uh not nutrition but good absorption yeah mm-hmm. it, you know it, it's actually a lie it's a delusion yeah i actually i had my first time in my life uh IV therapy at um interventional integrated, integrated spine, spine pain, pain and wellness, wellness. <laughs> <laughs> i know i was testing you guys <laughs> integrated spine pain and wellness right uh-huh. yesterday in uh at your office yeah. in in scottsdale arizona and it first of all it, was, it wasn't painful at all it was very very fun there's television there's 
catching up yeah, on my you Netflix. Can, exactly. <laughs> right. You have you're in a recliner. Yeah. We give you mm. like some something to drink, yeah, and warm something blanket, to eat, you know? a warm blanket. Yeah, it's a nice little cozy time. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I like that because tell me about the things that you injected into that you put into that mix. Uh, it was yeah. glutathione. We did glutathione for antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effect. We did uh, sorbic acid, which is vitamin C, mm -hmm. same, you know, antioxidant effect. It's a coenzyme for multiple processes throughout your body mm -hmm. that you need. So, um, and then what else do we do with you? Um, um, oh, NAD plus. <clears throat> tell me about NAD plus. Nicotinamine, nicotinamide yeah. adenine dinucleotide. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, basically a precursor to niacin if you will so this is a molecule that's found ubiquitously throughout our body so it's everywhere <clears throat> um every cell has it it's in the mitochondria it's, it's, it helps produce energy as we age our levels decline right and it's very hard to produce this naturally as we age so there are some supplements nmn is a big one that david dr david sinclair has been promoting as anti-aging that's nicotinamide mononucleotide so that's a precursor to nad plus what we can do, if you don't want to take it orally because the bioavailability may not be beneficial or as successful yeah. as IV, we can deliver an IV. And it can potentially give you more energy, help reduce cortisol levels, help yeah. you sleep better. So I can tell you from my perspective, I've been yeah. doing these weekly for almost a year now. And, you know, with a new practice, working 70 plus hours a week consistently. Se uh, se uh, more than 70. 70 to 80. Seven <clears throat> yeah. days a week. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. I can t and not having time to work out, unfortunately, which has been, uh, you know, a passion of mine is exercise, lifting weights, taking care of myself, being active. Um, it's been very limited with this practice, but I can, I feel for myself, NAD plus glutathione, these IV infusions I've been doing have allowed me to manage my stress and still have the energy to pursue my dream of building a very successful regenerative medicine practice. I mean, I've even being your wife, I've noticed a huge difference because, mm -hmm. you know, and I even notice a difference. I don't do it as much as you do. I notice the difference in myself, but I really notice a difference in you because you, and I don't know if the NAD, I'm thinking the NAD mm -hmm. has you know, is, is the answer for this, but you just seem less stressed and you seem like you're able to just roll with it. You know, everything that's coming your way, you're able to take on all of this work and responsibility and it doesn't even affect you. I don't know if I can attribute that to NAD plus, maybe a small component, but I really, I think that comes from meditation. Well, meditation, <clears throat> so but I've you've always meditated and, yeah. it, and it wasn't <clears throat> until you started doing because we okay. started the practice almost two years ago, and we didn't start doing the Ivy Wellness until probably what a year ago. Not even quite a year. Not ago. A, yeah, yeah, last summer. <clears throat> yeah. And you started doing this regularly, mm -hmm. and I would say in the first year there was definitely you know I felt more mm -hmm. of your stress, whereas now I don't feel your stress at all. Mm -hmm. You're very just. Namaste. Even keel, yeah. yeah, very namaste. George, tell us yeah. your experience. So we did the NAD for you yesterday. Mm -hmm. How do you feel today? You know, um, it's interesting because I don't know if it was people from that. I had the most vivid dreams last night, mm -hmm. and I don't know if there's some effect on my brain. It's fascinating because I I usually sleep and I don't have super vivid dreams, um, but last night uh, after that. Just absolutely the most vivid dreams and you know we only had a little bit of alcohol it wasn't like okay. anything else i yeah. could attribute it to mm -hmm. um it definitely is is painless mm -hmm. um the nad itself there is some sensation of warmth mm -hmm. and a little pressure if you run it if you have a high amount which i i insisted on <laughs> um, you did a very high amount yeah, i can't high. handle that but you you yeah. too can mm -hmm. um but you know i can tell you that everything that it has to promise with the very little minimal side effects it's something that I want to adopt. And it's not even so much that, I mean, I do want to offer it for my patients, but more importantly, what I want to do is I really want to bring it home to my family. Yeah. You know, um, it's an easy to do intervention that you could do. Obviously, if you're trained, you know, you can do it at home for your family. And I want to bring that back for my, my parents, my sister, yeah. um, my loved ones, my friends. And I think it's a powerful thing to give to offer people. I like that glutathione. We've known this. This is like basic biochemistry. Exactly. It's, it's um, 
it's a scavenger for 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 oxidants in the body now we eat blueberries and things like that but it's the same thing even if you buy the organic ones you know there's always this question of whether or not there's pesticides and things like that you know you know get pharmaceutical grade glutathione mm -hmm. again the bioavailability doesn't go through the liver doesn't go through right. the, you know and it all, more importantly i think there's a certain standard the, the supplement industry the standards people don't recognize that standard is actually quite low yeah <clears throat> This is why you can walk into a GNC and let's say you want to buy something like ginkgo and you'll see one bottle that's seven dollars, seven ninety nine, and you see another bottle that's ninety nine ninety nine. You mm -hmm. say, well, what's the difference between this ginkgo and that ginkgo? And they say, well, it says ginkgo on it. And I don't know if you guys know this, mm -hmm. but the supplement industry is so underregulated. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're well aware. Yeah, that it could be ginkgo bark, yeah, ginkgo mm -hmm. leaf, mm -hmm. or ginkgo <laughs> berry, and all the good stuff is in the berry. Mm -hmm. So you you don't know what you're buying. Right. So what I like about this is that when you say, hey, we're getting glutathione compounded from a trusted high end pharmacy, exactly. we know exactly where we're getting. It's mm -hmm. preservative free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. We get it expires shortly. So we have to get it. We get the best stuff delivered to the office. It's on ice. We put it in the fridge. We pull it out. We clean it off. We put it into your bag. We put deliver it to your body. No compromise. Exactly. Right. And that's what I want. I want that for me. I want that yeah. for you guys. And I want that for my patients. Absolutely. I want that for my family. And so, yeah, I'm going to bring this home now that you've taught me how to do it. And I'm going to get all your protocols before I leave. Yeah, for sure. More importantly, you know, I, I'm going to offer it to my patients, but I really, I, I just want to bring it home for me. Yeah. I want to give it to myself. I want to give it to my mom. Yeah. yeah. I want to give it to my dad. You know, yeah. that's, and, and, but it's the same thing. We can offer these things for people. And I can tell you, there's so many people out, out there offering this. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> assuredly, I can tell you, just like everything else we do, practicing medicine long enough, you know that there are people that cut corners. Mm -hmm. Right. And so pe patients come to us and say, well, you know, Dr. Chanchin, why, you know, somebody asked me, a doctor asked me this. He said, he said George, I want to send you a patient. I said, oh, he said, what do you charge? I said, well, this is what I charge. He said, that seems expensive. And I was like, well, you know, you're literally referring me someone from New Jersey. I live in California. You want someone to fly five, six hours to come see me. And then you want to like, you're looking for that like 99 cent store pricing. And I'm like, well, you know, listen, if you can invest that, you understand that what I offer my patients, same thing, mm -hmm. why people come come to you from all over the country. You're not a discount doctor. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> but they, don't want, they, they won't get discount service, mm -hmm. right? They exactly. will get what, what we are trying to do, which is literally achieving the highest level, yeah. right? <clears throat> Practicing at the highest level of what we can offer people so they can live healthier, longer lives, right? It's premium care. It's premium care. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think that's important, but it's the same thing. So I, I want to bring that home. I want to offer to my, mostly it's just, I just want to bring it to my family. That's the most important thing to me. And we can, once we have that, we can obviously offer to other people. But I think that's the difference when you mm -hmm. come to your practice, you know, you offer everything. You never compromised. Mm -hmm. And I respect that so much. Mm -hmm. You never compromise. You've always been like, George, what's the best? What can I offer my patients that I think is the best? For sure. And you said, that's what I'm going to buy. That's what we're going to bring in. Mm -hmm. The investment is going to pay off in spades. And I think that's yeah. important. The main focus is the patient mm -hmm. and giving them the best care and giving them the best education and best information that we can so they can make their own choices and live the best <coughs> that they Excuse want. <clears throat> you know, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's like, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, not being in the medical field, it just, you know, I know what it's like to go to a doctor out there and receive mediocre care, yeah. right? And so when you are really, when when health is important to you, <clears throat> you know, so is your care, your doctor, whoever, the, the doctor that you choose. So for me, I will spend a little bit more and go to a doctor that's going to think outside the box like you guys, instead of just getting that, you know, basically you know, cookie everyday cutter. cookie, thank <clears throat> yeah. you, cookie cutter, mm -hmm. everyday protocol that mm -hmm. some doctors are providing. And then another thing we're doing is we provide resources for our community, mm -hmm. not just our patients, but yeah. anyone out there in the entire world who decides, hey, look, I pop this Dr. Ashu Boyle popped up in my Instagram feed. You click yeah. on it. We have tons of videos like and then yeah. your your site. I mean, mm -hmm. hundreds of recipes, mm -hmm. easy yeah. to explain. I mean, they're all free. They're all free. They're <clears throat> yeah. at your fingertips. Yeah, and this all conversation. Or less. <clears throat> it's on YouTube. Yeah. It'll be on yeah. YouTube, and it's it's totally accessible to everyone because this mm -hmm. is what it's about. Really, is educating people. So hopefully, if even just one person gets something out of this, 
mission accomplished. You want um, people to feel better, <clears throat> right? Exactly. You want people to live happy lives. Like mm-hmm. that's the goal, Absolutely. right? Like you don't want people to be in pain. You don't want people to feel sad or in pain, you know, and misery suffer. mm-hmm. and suffering. Yeah, mm-hmm. you want people to because when everybody's happy, the world is happy. Exactly. You know, <clears throat> that's what we gotta do. We just gotta love each other a little bit more. I love your positivity. <clears throat> you know, I think people lose sight of that, right? Yeah. It, it really is like you, you reap what you sow and the energy that you put out, you receive. And it sounds so kind of hokey and stuff, but it's absolutely yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The energy you put out in the world, like it, it comes back and folds. So you put out negative energy. The only thing you'll recognize is negativity. Mm-hmm. Right. And in the end, the love you make is equal to the love you take. Uh, I love I it. Love the mortal it. words of John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. Love you. <laughs> Thank you for having Thank me. You. Yeah. Thank thanks you so for much, being George. Here. Okay, so yeah. just <clears throat> tell the community, tell yeah, people your <clears throat> who are like, give them all your information so they can look you up, they can learn from you, follow you, yes. and come see you for treatments. For the thousands of people who watch your your, your <laughs> YouTube channel, the hundreds of thousands. <laughs> uh, my name is George Shang Shen. Uh, I'm a physiatrist down in Southern, Southern California. You can follow me on Instagram, Regen Med Doctor, R E G E N M E D D O C T O R, Regen Med Doctor. Uh, you can give me a call at 949-229-2299. I'll be the one who answers the phone. So we'll see how many thousand. It'll be ringing up with the yes. computer already. Um, thank you guys coming. so much for yeah. having yeah. me. It's been a pleasure to be yeah. here. Yeah, and no. I'll put all your information in the show notes so people yeah. can easily find thank you. you. And mm-hmm. yeah. No, it's truly been our pleasure yeah. and an honor. Yeah. Thank so, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.